Welcome to this week's episode of The Read Out Loud, a weekly biotech podcast from STAT. I'm Allison DeAngelis. I'm Adam Feuerstein. Damien Garday is out this week. It's Thursday, November 16th, and here's what we're going to talk about. United Health Group, the nation's largest insurance company, is under fire after former employees reported that they were pressured to cut off payments for seriously ill patients in lockstep with an algorithm designed to predict how long patients needed to stay in rehab. Our colleague Casey Ross joins us to discuss the STAT investigation. And after that, biotech veteran Michael Gilman gives us a behind the scenes peek at what it's like to be a startup CEO in this economic depression. And he might also teach us a new cocktail recipe. But first, a first, a CRISPR based medicine has been approved. All that after a word from our sponsor. With a focus on genetics and genomic research, Regeneron Genetics Center is revolutionizing the industry with new discoveries. Today, I'm joined by Tim Thornton, Senior Director of Statistical Genetics at RGC, to learn more about the future of genome sequencing and a white paper on the yield of genetic association signals from genomes, exomes, and imputation. We really wanted to understand what are the implications for these different approaches? How does it impact your ability to discover new genetic signals? Tim, where can listeners learn more about Regeneron Genetics Center? The best place is Regeneron.com. So Adam, uh, you, for some reason, were up at 3 a.m. this morning and were uh, early to the to the punch on seeing the news out of the UK about a first in the world of gene editing. Uh, tell us. Yeah, we're not going to talk about why I was up at 3 a.m., no. but yes, I was up <laughs> at 3 a.m. It doesn't Allison. even surprise me. You, you <laughs> sleep weird hours. Um, but tell us about the approval of, you know, CRISPR and Vertex's uh, CRISPR treatment. Right. Well, let's uh, we'll get uh, we'll get the pronunciation out of the way. This is a medicine that's called Casjevi. And uh, like you said, it is the first CRISPR-based medicine to be approved anywhere in the world. Uh, UK, the UK regulatory agency uh, got sort of the jump on the FDA and the broader European community, which are obviously also reviewing this medicine and are expected to make an approval relatively soon. But yes, it is now approved in the in the UK. And you know, this is a, this is a you know use whatever sort of superlative that you want. Um, this is a groundbreaking treatment. Uh, you know, a big day for the sickle cell community. This is essentially the first uh, cure for, or potential cure, we should say, for sickle cell disease. And then, you know, from a scientific standpoint, it's it's also a a super important day because this is the first medicine, you know, built on a, a CRISPR, you know, based on CRISPR technology that has been approved anywhere. I do want to give a shout out to uh, Damien and a comment he did make on Slack this morning that this may have well been <laughs> the greatest benefit of Brexit is that the UK reviewers, as you said, Adam, got the jump on both the US and Europe. And I'm still mentally trying to remind myself that those are now separate entities. Um, but yes, this was a uh, very surprisingly quick approval um, out of the UK. Um leading to what is the first commercial medicine for CRISPR therapeutics. So Adam, what has have CRISPR and Vertex said about, you know, the launch of this in the UK, the the pricing of Casjevi? What do we know? Um, they haven't said very much. Um, there has not been a price disclosed quite yet. Uh, what the company told us is that, you know, they're working through NICE, which is the sort of the reimbursement body in the UK. They're working through reimbursement and obviously patient access. Um, that can be a, a rather extended uh, negotiation, as I think most people know that, you know, NICE can sort of play hardball when it comes to pricing of me- new medicines in the UK. Um, And it's also a relatively small patient population in the UK. Now, you know, technically we said this was for sickle cell. It was actually approved both for sickle cell disease and for beta thalassemia, which is another kind of related blood disorder. But, you know, Vertex said that or estimates that there's probably about 2,000 people in the UK who would be eligible uh, for for, uh, this medicine there. You know, the the, the approval that we're all waiting for here is in the US where, and in Europe, where, you know, there are a lot more people with these diseases. So I think, you know, those approvals will be more consequential um, for, you know, for the patient population. And we should note that that 
U.S. decision date is coming in a couple of weeks. They have a t- they have a, a deadline of December eighth. That's right. United Health Group, the nation's largest health insurer, has been pressuring its employees to cut off payments for seniors and people with disabilities based on the calculations of a computer algorithm, a practice that has boosted profits while denying care to patients in need. That's the takeaway from a weighty stat investigation published this week by reporters Casey Ross and Bob Herman. Within hours of that publication, plaintiffs filed a class action lawsuit against United Health, claiming the company illegally denied care despite knowing its prized algorithm was prone to errors. This is the latest and perhaps most jarring development from Stat's ongoing reporting on how so-called innovative computer models are impacting everyday health care. And today, Casey Ross joins us to explain what's going on. Casey, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So, Casey, let's start from about 30,000 feet. Uh, We're talking about patients here who qualify for Medicare and have elected to get their health services through UnitedHealth. What is this algorithm, and how has UnitedHealth described its benefits? So the algorithm takes in a bunch of data about you, your primary diagnosis, other medical problems, your living situation, and other details, and it analyzes that data to produce a report. And the report lays out what your likely care needs are going to be during your stay uh, in a rehab facility and what kind of care you might need after. And at the end of the report, it predicts what your length of stay in the facility is likely to be. Uh, So at the end, it will say something like your estimated length of stay is 16 days or 14 days or 12 days. Um, And that prediction is used then by the company to determine, you know, when uh, it might cut off payment for your care. So this algorithm is something that United Health actually got through an acquisition uh, a couple of years ago. What has been happening within the company since that acquisition? So talking to case managers within the company that are subject to this algorithm, uh, they have found that they have much less discretion to deviate from the algorithm, that their managers are putting pressure on them to follow the algorithm um, within a very narrow band. So we got some documents from within the company that showed, in fact, that the case managers that use the algorithm were told uh, that they should hit a target of keeping their patient stays within 1% of the days predicted by the algorithm. And so just to do the math on that and how it works, if you're a case manager at the company and say you have 10 patients and those 10 patients are allotted 100 days in the skilled nursing facility, if those 10 patients stay more than 101 days collectively, then you've missed the target. So to simplify this, United Health has a fancy computer that tells people or tells its employees when to kick grandma or grandpa out of the rehab center. Uh, you have you have talked to former case managers as part of your reporting, you know, who were t- were tasked with carrying out these denials under threat of reprimand or uh, or even termination. Um, what did they tell you? I mean, to be honest, talking to them about the use of the algorithm, it, uh, in some ways, it almost felt like I was taking confessions from people because they felt, you know, they had a professional duty to advocate for these people. But because of the job performance targets, they had to choose between doing well in their job and keeping their job or following their conscience and trying to advocate for people who were desperately ill and needed more care. And they were really in a terrible situation. And they explained to me patients that were very, very, very sick. And uh, they, because of the pressure being put on them, felt obligated to recommend that they be cut off from care that they clearly needed. You mentioned in the story that in addition to this ethical question that case managers are, are facing about if they're doing right by their patients, United Health might also be violating or kind of coming, you know, into conflict with federal rules around how they make decisions by using this algorithm and the way that they're using 
this algorithm? What what's the problem there? And and what did United Health have to say for itself when you kind of brought your findings to them? Yeah, these uh, these decisions are governed by a very complicated set of rules that Medicare oversees. Uh, it's the Chapter Eight criteria, um, and these are criteria that that govern when a patient um, is. Uh, qualifies for additional care and when they might be cut off from care and issued a payment denial. But the, what's happening in this situation is that United Health and other insurers that use its algorithm um, are substituting their algorithm for the rules because, you know, they're saying you get 16 days under the algorithm and they're initiating a process to cut off their care in concert with that algorithm. And there just isn't, um, you know, any leeway that they're given or, you know, even though, you know, and I read every single page of the Medicare rules, and there's a lot of caveats in those rules that allow for circumstances where people might need more care for a whole host of different reasons. Um, but they're, they're sort of slamming through that with the algorithm. What United says about it is that, well, listen, we have a physician medical reviewer at the end of the day who's looking at all of this and is looking at the full uh, file of the patient and then making a decision. So that, that physician medical reviewer is a check on the algorithm and we're not, you know, we're not violating the Medicare rules or kicking people out. Um, what, you know, but the problem with that is that you know, in a lot of the cases that we've seen, these patients are you know, winning appeals, what you can file an appeal to a payment denial and they win the appeal or, you know, they end up just needing much more care and have to pay out of pocket for it. Uh, so the algorithm really is not uh, is not accurate. And then the physician is really not providing um, a very effective backstop. So as we mentioned earlier, a class action lawsuit materialized almost immediately uh, after your story was published. Who are the plaintiffs and what are they suing for? Yeah, so the plaintiffs are Medicare beneficiaries um, situated all over the country who have been denied um, uh, care that they felt they need uh, based on the use of this algorithm. And they're uh, suing for breach of contract um, and um, sort of bad faith dealing by the insurance companies and violation of a whole bunch of state uh, insurance laws that require uh, good faith dealing. Uh, so there's uh, there's a whole host of claims within the, in the class action suit, and uh, a lot of these people have been forced to drain their life savings in order to pay for care that they felt they need needed, uh, and so they're trying to get recovery of of those losses. So. As you write in the story, this co commitment to this algorithm, you know, United Health using this algorithm so heavily is a, quote, cautionary sign to an industry that is becoming increasingly infatuated with data driven decision making. Um, how can you expand on that? How is that playing out in the rest of the healthcare ecosystem? Yeah, we're at a time period where the the appetite for using these kinds of tools, predictive tools and artificial intelligence to make decisions about the care of patients is is at its absolute highest point. I mean, there is so much hype and so much energy around using these tools and what these tools can do for a lot of the people that control them is save a lot of money. Uh, or make a lot of money on um, providing care in different ways, or in this case, um, preventing people from getting the care that they needed. Uh, these are very, very powerful institutions um, and and companies, and they have these tools. Uh, they have the power to implement them almost unilaterally because there's nobody really overseeing the use of these tools. Uh, so it, it's a very dangerous moment where huge, powerful companies own very powerful tools that can really um, undermine people's health and safety and access to care. Uh, and unless there's somebody watching or there's somebody holding them accountable and, and watching carefully about how they're using these tools and how the tools themselves are configured, um, you know, then people are going to really be, be harmed.
So Casey, congrats on, you know, this is some really impactful reporting. Uh, and if you want to read more about the story or re- want to read this story, um, check it out on our website at www.statnews.com. Casey, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Michael Gilman is a man who probably doesn't need much of an introduction to our biotech-savvy listening audience, but in case you're unfamiliar, he is a scientist and serial entrepreneur. Today, he's the CEO of Arrakis Therapeutics, a privately held biotech developing oral drugs that target RNA. Those are the messenger-like molecules that turn genetic instructions into proteins. Michael is also a Canadian by birth, a former disc jockey, a lover of hockey, a guitarist, and a fairly accomplished cocktail mixologist. Uh, More on that later. It's been a while since we caught up with Arrakis, so Michael joins us for an update. Michael, welcome back to The Read Out Loud. Hey, thank you. It is great to be here. So give us the elevator pitch to explain, you know, what Arrakis is doing to target disease-causing RNA. Yeah, so we started out six or seven years ago to solve the general problem of finding drug-like small molecule ligands that hit RNA. And when we started, I mean, people thought we were nuts, that it it couldn't be done. Um, But fast forward six or seven years ago, uh, and we've done it. That problem is now solved. The chemistry problem, at least, is now solved, which is to say that Given an RNA of therapeutic interest, we can figure out where the pockets are. We can validate that those pockets exist inside living cells. We can faithfully recapitulate those folded structures in the lab and use those RNAs to detect high throughput screens, all the requisite assays required to improve the qualities of those compounds up to and including now structure-based drug design. We actually have X-ray crystal structures now of our ligands bound to RNA, which are revealing to us the, the, um, uh, the intimate rules of molecular recognition uh, for RNA. And, and the goal here, of course, is to uh, hit any uh, conceivable RNA in the cell. And those could be messenger RNAs that encode proteins that are hard to drug um, with our existing toolkit. They could be disease-specific RNAs, which is kind of what we're doing in our lead program, MYC, where you have actually different RNAs in tumors than you have in normal cells. They express the same protein, so you can't distinguish those things at the level of protein, but you can at the level of RNA. And then, of course, for every messenger RNA in the cell, there are 10 non-coding RNAs that don't make proteins, so you don't have that option. If you want to hit those RNAs, you got to go straight for the RNA. So as you mentioned, Michael, uh, MYC is the target of your lead uh, project, and uh, MYC is a so-called oncogene. It's identified, I guess, in, kind of in the early 1980s, right? T- tell us a little bit about that work. How is it progressing? Yeah, I actually worked on MYC as a postdoc in the early 1980s, so this is a uh, long-running problem for me. Uh, MYC is a transcription factor uh, at the level of protein. It is essentially featureless and has been pretty resistant to most of our uh, attempts as an industry to to drug it. And as uh, Jen Petter, our founder, famously said, um, the RNA has got to be easier to drug than the protein. Uh, and, And actually it is. The RNA is very intricately folded. It's chock full of pockets. And we've identified a compound now, a series, series of compounds we've made close to a thousand, that uh, interact with the MYC messenger RNA and block translation. And uh, they look for all the world like oral, uh, like an oral RNAi. They sort of, they, they look the same as, a, as an siRNA in the lab, highly selective inhibitors of MYC. And we're actually, as I've indicated, targeting a transcript, a message, MYC messenger RNA that is selectively activated in, in, certain, in certain classes of tumors. So this is a compound that prevents MYC expression only in cells that have this particular messenger RNA and really doesn't touch MYC um, in other cells. We're pretty excited about it. We've got very potent compounds. They, they work in animals. Um, and, you know, we expect this to be our first clinical program. And when do you think that might be? Yeah, that's a good question, People, which people <laughs> ask all the time. Uh, you know, and, you know, and, and we, we have an internal goal. I mean, the, you know, and, and I, I, I'd prefer not to publicly disclose it simply because, 
you know, what we've learned along the way is that RNA is constantly throwing us curveballs, you know, and, and uh, but I'm, I, I'm hoping we're in the clinic, um, uh, you know, not next year, but the year after. So your pipeline also includes uh, an antiviral against SARS-CoV-2. Um, tell us about that. I, I didn't realize you were working on that. Well, we are. I mean, I'm not sure I would call that a program so much anymore, um, uh, you know, mostly because, uh, you know, at least at the moment, people don't seem to be too terribly worried about it. Um, uh, on the other hand, you'd think that the fact that people are no longer taking their vaccines will make it actually a pretty sustainable business. But, <laughs> but we're, you know, we're interested in viruses in general, particularly RNA viruses, right? Because um, uh, the, the RNA does a lot of work in those viruses. And we actually uh, have been using SARS-CoV-2 to, to kind of figure out how to make antivirals more broadly. And we have uh, identified compounds that, that bind to regulatory structures in the viral genome. We have crystal structures of those complexes, so we know exactly how those compounds interact. And we're actually using the SARS-CoV-2 system to work out one of our um, uh, new manifestations uh, of RNA targeted medicines, which is we've ma- we're making covalent compounds. So we've discovered a warhead that allows us to put permanent um, site-specific adducts on RNA. And so the idea here is that you can actually uh, permanently inactivate the viral genome. And we're pretty excited about that as, a, as an application, not just for antivirals, but we know now that if we put one of these adducts in the middle of the coding region of a messenger RNA, you know, the ribosome just hits it and gives up. So uh, we think this will be a very effective means for um, blocking translation of RNA in a selective fashion. Hmm. There, you know, you are obviously working in this field, RNA, that caught a lot of attention, you know, in kind of the pandemic. And I don't know if it's too soon to call it post-pandemic, but, you know, these these non-acute post-COVID outbreak years. Did you feel that? I, I imagine that you might have also felt a little bit of the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act being a company that has focused on small molecules, how have the outside forces in the drug industry affected, if at all, what's happening at Arrakis? Well, I mean, we have to, you know, deal with all of the same broad macro issues that everybody else is dealing with, like the, you know, the crappy capital markets uh, and all of that. I mean, the, um, you know, the sort of uh, enthusiasm for RNA, I suppose, has helped us, although, you know, we are not you know, using RNA to make things. We are trying to figure out how to stop RNA from making things. Um, but, but um, you know, RNA is going to be, I think, the target of the future, right? So, you know, 95% uh, of the medicines we take are directed at proteins. You know, today, of course, we saw the approval of, you know, arguably the, you know, the first medicine that uh, uh, for which DNA is actually the target. Uh, I, I, I don't know how broad a solution that's going to be when you think across the whole sort of spectrum uh, of human disease. But um, um, everything ultimately, all biological information ultimately goes through RNA, right? And so, um, so RNA is everywhere. And figuring out how to generally um, uh, mess with RNA biology, I think is going to be um, uh, critically important for the future of medicine. So from a financial and capital markets perspective, you know, 2023 obviously obviously has been a miserable year for biotechs. You know, you've been around a really long time, Michael. You've lived through many ups and downs in this sector. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about whether this current situation is any different. You know, I uh, so first of all, thank you um, for pointing out how old I am. I mean, I I, I I will acknowledge that you played the age card last week when you told that story about Zevlin. Um, yes, I uh, did. <laughs> and I'm um, even older than you, sadly. Uh, and and look, you know, I guess the one observation I would report to you, based on all of that, all that time, is that market cycles are short and drug development cycles are long, relatively speaking, right? And so, you know the the key to um, persisting through a market like this, like I can't control, none of us can control the externalities of the market, right? We can't control interest rates. 
Um, we can't control um, wars. Uh, we can't control any of that stuff, right? We can only kind of control what we do and what the people and what the people around us do. And we can't even control what the people around us do. We can try to kind of help them think about what they have to do. And so what I'm getting at is that for me, uh, the most important characteristic that one has to maintain in a market like this is conviction, right? You have to continue to believe in the thing that you're doing. Uh, you have to sustain that conviction in the people around you, your employees, uh, your board, all of your stakeholders, and you just kind of have to keep your head down and continue to move the ball downfield because cycles do reverse. And um, we've been fortunate at Arrakis that um, you know we we've we've got a couple of very strong partnerships with Roche and Amgen that have really helped us learn how to do this and help us scale and help us advance the technology and importantly it's put a lot of cash in our bank account. Our last financing round was well over four years ago. It was in April of 2019. Um, so we haven't had to go to the capital markets for a while. And we're not going to have to go for a while because we still got, you know, quite a bit of money in the bank. And and, uh, and so we've been, you know, we're lucky we can sort of um, ride it out. Um, but, you know, the, the issue is that, um, uh, it, you know, the, there's a psychological challenge here, right? I mean, people just get very mopey about the markets. And, um and so it's sort of more of a psychological problem in a way than it is a business problem. You've just got to kind of keep people's spirits up uh, and you've just got to keep making progress. So as we mentioned at the top of this chat, you know, you have a lot of interests that extend beyond biotech. Um, I know nothing about hockey, so I'm going to ask you about your at home bartending. Uh, so for, you know, anyone who's kind of followed you on social media, you've, you know, they've probably seen you posting your Friday night cocktail recipes. Can you offer up a, a cocktail recipe for our Read Out Loud listeners? Oh, for sure. For sure. So so I, I, I can tell you what, you know, I mean, I was always been interested in cocktails, but what really got me thinking about making them myself was actually one night at the bar at the, you know, late lamented uh, Craigie on Main uh, in, oh. in 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 Cambridge, you know, between Kendall Square and, and Central Square. Yeah, what a great restaurant and and a particularly great bar. And I was sitting at the bar there one night, and you know, I, I had gotten in the habit of sort of trying to do a kind of like a bartender's choice kind of thing. And I, you know, I asked the bartender, "Can you make me something with whiskey and citrus?" And he made me a cocktail called a Paper Plane, and a pa and it was delicious. Paper plane is a great gateway cocktail for somebody who wants to get into mixology. First of all, you know, first of all, because it's delicious. Uh, but second of all, because it is dead easy. It's got four ingredients, equal parts, right? So it's almost impossible to screw up. I mean, I've done it on occasion by forgetting, <laughs> forgetting an ingredient. But, um, um, but, it, but it, it's really easy. Uh, equal parts, typically three quarters of an ounce of bourbon, uh, of lemon juice, uh, of Aperol, and of a, you know, the more obscure reagent is an Italian Amaro called Amaro Anino. So three quarters of an ounce of each of those things into a shaker, shake the hell out of it, um, uh, strain it into a cocktail glass, which you should pre-chill, by the way. That's, oh, you see, that, you know, that there's the, that's the key, right? You got to get that pre-chilled glass. Okay. Yeah. What's our garnish? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> garnish. Yeah. Usually, usually just a lemon peel. Um, and, 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 and so, so it's great. It, it is a real crowd pleaser. Everybody loves it. Even people who claim they don't like whiskey drinks love this drink. And so it's a great place to start. And so it turns out now that there's a whole bunch of these four equal parts cocktails, and they're so easy to make. And you can play around with them. You can substitute this. You can substitute that. And they're still very much go-tos uh, at the Gilman Bar on Friday night. I actually have, uh, I'm, I'm guilty of uh, liking an Aperol spritz in the summertime. So I actually have a bottle of Aperol still in the house. I do need to go out and buy a bottle of Amaro though. So I'm going to go do that. And then I'll report back to you how my, uh, how my cocktail mixology compares to yours. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Michael, on that note, uh, thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. It's always fun to talk to you guys.
That does it for another episode of The Read Out Loud. Thank you to Teresa Gaffney for producing this week's episode. Our senior producers are Hyacinth Epinado and Alyssa Ambrose. Our executive producer is Rick Burke. And our theme music is by Brian Joel. We'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you like about this week's episode, what you didn't like, and what cocktail you'll be enjoying this Friday. You can do all of that by sending us an email at readoutloud at statnews.com. And if you like what we do, leave a review or a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you use to get your podcasts. See you next week.